History will look back on 2016 as a dark year for humanity for one reason or another, but I recently heard someone describe it as a pretty awful year for video games. Now, maybe this is just me looking for the silver lining, but I didn't think it was that bad. Video games are supposed to be an escape from reality, so it wouldn't really work if they were equally bad this year. If I had better production values, I'd start presenting these videos with a top hat, maybe a cane, and a whole host of golden envelopes. Next year, I'll, I'll come prepared. I think a video like this is important since over the course of a year we tend to focus heavily on the negative side of gaming. Though with the video about the worst games of the year coming next week, one of them was a lot easier to make than the other. I think because AAA developers didn't shit the bed as much as last year. Of course there are a few high profile failures, but games came out of expectation and were actually as good if not better than anticipated. How often have we been able to say that recently? And since this video is going up the week before Christmas, feel free to use this as some kind of buying guide. And if they don't like it, tell them to go fuck themselves. But in a Christmassy way. Depending on who you ask, you might get the sense that video games are generally getting easier. And even if they aren't getting easier, the means of which the game explains its rules is more in your face than ever before. Good news is that puzzle games don't really do this. I don't think they've ever done this. Wouldn't be as much fun if they sat you down and slowly took you through each and every possibility that might make up a solution later down the line. Well, this is where The Witness comes into its own. Not a lot is explained to you and there sure isn't a lot of story to help string you along. But if you like puzzles, we sure have some of those. And importantly, The Witness lets you know about these puzzles and their solutions through strictly non-verbal communication. So if you're one of these people who want to be let off their leash and figure it out for yourself, The Witness was made with you in mind. Not only that, but it's all set against a backdrop of a quiet, almost eerie island that you explore in pursuit of more of these maze puzzles. It'd be nice if this island was fleshed out a bit more and if solving the puzzles gave some kind of feedback about what all this means, but that's really not what this game is for. You're here to solve puzzle after puzzle with rapidly increasing difficulty that may leave some people scratching their heads at best or hurling things through windows at worst. Less a game for people interested in intricate world building and more about putting as much brain power as you're willing to part with towards these puzzles. It's like a big collection of crosswords. No one's ever got frustrated at a crossword, right? You tend to look back on childhood memories as simpler times where quality didn't come with a catch. Usually it's those magical rose tinted lenses screwing with your perception of past events, but I can definitely say that Harvest Moon is a franchise that has seen better days. Those days when I was growing up playing games like A Wonderful Life, Friends of Mineral Town, fucking magical melody, what a, what a game that was. Nowadays the series has lost its way a bit and you can't really match these experiences without playing the older games. This would be seen as a serious problem if the world was lacking amazing indie developers. And Eric Barone might just be my favourite person from 2016. The way that indie games are developed means that we're getting more games that were influenced by something the developer played when they grew up. You're getting developers who have played these kind of games before and understand what people like about them. That's a recipe for success that very rarely goes wrong. Stardew Valley was originally intended to be a simple fan-made alternative to Harvest Moon, but when Eric Barone realised that more needed to be fixed to recapture the essence of the franchise, this glorious tribute to everything that Harvest Moon should be was born. And once you get in, there's no chance of escape until you put at least three weeks of your time into it. I talk about the essence of Harvest Moon, and it's fucking this. Growing crops and getting to know a bunch of random townspeople isn't all that interesting, you might think, but see if you still think that once you've put some time into it. It's an engrossing experience that shows just how good this kind of game can be, and look at those sprites. One man made this. One glorious man. I feel like you could look through the list of games released in 2016 and struggle to find a particular anomaly, but it did feel like this year was where FPS games came back with a vengeance. Many were released from different developers and backgrounds, and there's a few you'll see later in this video, but the most interesting of the bunch was this quirky game by the name of Superhot. And while you do shoot people in it, calling it an FPS game almost feels slanderous. 
It's a puzzle game, but one of the most hands-on, gratifying puzzle games you'll ever play. The gimmick with Super Hot is that time only moves when you do, which I've seen explored in Braid, but this ain't no platformer, son! Go back to Mario, you weenie! Here we throw katanas in slow motion! Reminds me a lot of Hotline Miami, really. Effectively, you're slowly constructing some ridiculous action set piece through the same kind of trial and improvement instant respawn learning methods that gives you quick feedback but feels unbelievably satisfying when it all comes together. Nothing is handed on a plate to you here. Your enemies have as much time as you do to get their work done, and if you die, it's almost always your fault. It's a bit rough around the edges, but there's enough here for one hell of a sequel if the passion is there. Work on the story, I have no idea what's, what's going on here. Somehow, I'll get by without caring. Playing games that come out at the start of a new year is always a little bit strange. Big name developers get their games out for the holidays, and so you spend the first few months of 2016 playing whatever interesting indie games float to the surface. The last three games I've mentioned all came out around that time, but none got me thinking about them for longer after than Firewatch. A game where you walk around a bit, look at a map a few times, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting, trust me. Some will say that walking simulators don't deserve their place as a genre of gaming, but I really don't mind them as long as you're being taken through an engaging story. Firewatch is less about orienteering your way around this dense national park looking for naked teenagers, and more about a deeply engrossing narrative that delves deep into themes of escapism, isolation, even the, the fucking meaning of life is in there. Not the answer, just, you know, what are you even doing? Why do you do the things you do? I'd go as far as saying that pound for pound it was the most engrossing story I experienced in 2016 and a pretty dynamite game in general. A Little bit hard to recommend a walking simulator to people who have their own idea of what games should be, but Christ on a bike, you're walking through some amazing environments. This is where this type of game really shines and not many have done it better than good old Firewatch. Needed a better ending though, and more fires. The mundanity of a lot of the gameplay in Firewatch just means that you can reserve more brain power towards following the story. When you're told to go somewhere, you don't really wonder how you get there, more so why you're being asked to go there in the first place. That's the critical thing about walking simulators, you gotta make the walking interesting. I haven't played Team Fortress 2 since late 2014. That'll become a bit more relevant later, hopefully. But it's not like the game has been overflowing with exciting new content in that time. They had the CSGO weapon skins, some promotional items. Meet Your Match did. I'm, I'm not sure what it did. Wasn't there aliens in there too? I'm sure some of this is good stuff, but I haven't missed it as much as I thought I would. But not so long ago, I was seeing headlines saying how good TF2 was, and you have to wonder why all this sudden praise. Turns out they weren't talking about Team Fortress 2. They were talking about Titanfall 2. Don't do this. And yet, as a strange knock-on, I ended up reading said articles, playing Titanfall 2, and adoring it. The first game famously didn't have a single-player campaign because the studio behind it wasn't all that big, and because, hey, who the hell plays anything other than multiplayer these days? The sequel did, though, which is good news for me, since my internet is a reasonably-sized potato with cables sticking out of it. In this enclosed environment, you develop a great appreciation for the game's mechanics and how they all blend together superbly. I didn't expect to come out of Titanfall 2's campaign having just played some of the best design levels I've ever seen, but yeah, that happened. Also, your Titan is pretty much the best character in the game. Didn't expect that either. I'm sure multiplayer is pretty sweet. If it's half as fun as some of these levels are, then you'll be able to get a lot out of it. I can't. My internet's a potato. It's a serious problem. The saying goes that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but hell, we do it anyway, because it's, it's a lot of fun. Even if you are putting your judgement in the firing line, it just means that if a game turns out to be amazing when initially it looked a bit shit, everyone wins, except maybe your integrity, but who the hell needs that nowadays? Uh, by the way, uh, can, can we try and smash like 50,000 likes or something? I think that's reasonable. Uh, remember to subscribe and comment. Uh, I need my money so I can pay my bills. Uh, if you don't, I'll kill a panda, so it's on you now. Oh, the jokes we made when we first saw Doom's box art. They were good jokes, still looks a bit generic even now, but the good thing about box art is that you don't really look at it after you've loaded the game up. 
By the time you're firing your way through massive hordes of demons in unrelenting action-filled set pieces, you kinda forget about all of this. Doom has to be the surprise of the year for me. Too often recently have we seen uninspired continuations of classic franchises without really capturing the essence of what made the original so great. I and I think many others didn't expect a lot from Doom, but then the reviews started coming in and word of mouth spread that actually, actually, it's really good. Weapons have a great kick to them, the glory kills are both unbelievably satisfying and add a layer of complexity to the combat that keeps everything interesting, and I enjoyed a Doom game for the first time in a long time. It doesn't pretend to be some uber pretentious insight into the human condition, just have a big gun, here's some demons, you know the rest. Some days you just want to sit down and play something uncomplicated. I wonder if we can get a good Alone in the Dark game now. Probably shouldn't push it. So a few years ago I played a weird game called Limbo. I say that like no one else did, many people did, it was a good game. And as you progress through the chapters and the different obstacles the game throws at you, you start thinking that an expansion to this game would be incredible. The basic premise is there and it works for telling a fascinating condensed story, but oh, we could go bigger, couldn't we? Hey, if you want to put more money into a game like Limbo, I can't think of anyone who'll complain. Inside is every bit the game I hoped it would be, and that is supersized Limbo. You don't get any dialogue to read or listen to, but what you do get is a lesson in storytelling through atmosphere and expert world building. In the short time you spend journeying through the intricate world of wherever this is, you'll probably die many times to dangers that you couldn't have seen coming, but you'll also be jumping and puzzling your way through this beautifully designed game that puts the focus on the world rather than one specific character like in Limbo. Also this lighting, we need to talk about the lighting. Remember how in Limbo everything was mostly really dark with any light being used for contrast? Most things are well lit during inside, but especially points of interest. You spend the game walking towards the light. That probably wasn't intentional. This game doesn't need more factors contributing to the narrative. It was another strange year for Nintendo. I guess you can split the last 12 months in half and end up with a period of uncertainty closely followed by one of renewed optimism about the future. There was some controversy about Fire Emblem Fates, ridiculous success in the form of Pokemon Go, and even a console reveal that didn't immediately reduce people to furiously writing Nintendo's obituary. Little bit crazy really, but all throughout this Pokemon was celebrating its 20th anniversary and while Pokemon Go made the headlines, Sun and Moon were raising the bar. Just as well, really, since Nintendo hyped the shit out of it, but we needn't have worried. Having played more of it since my review at the end of November, I found a few things I don't like, such as the removal of super training and the endless loop of SOS battles, but overall it's a massive leap in the right direction that should give the franchise enough material to work with for a little while longer. Trading out gym leaders for island trials, getting rid of HMs in favour of Pokeride, being able to send the PC Pokemon into the acid mine. Everything has been looked at and refined if needed, and nearly everything works perfectly. Though I've been playing it pretty much constantly since it came out and my Pokedex is virtually full and I'm still wondering if Game Freak couldn't have just released these games with the national decks available from the start, or at least after the Elite Four. Oh well, I get a brief moment with some sense of accomplishment. When a developer states that they're releasing a game that will act as the finale for a series that you haven't really been keeping up with, suddenly you're forced into this mad panic of rapidly consuming a whole trilogy of excellent action games in as short a period of time as possible. So I rushed through the Uncharted games and enjoyed a lot of it, though some of the first games used of the cover system can fuck off, just in time for the release of the fourth and final game in the franchise. And damn. I still don't think it's as good as the second game, since few games are, but oh, it has its good moments. Most noticeably for me, having finished the third game in the original trilogy roughly a week before the fourth game came out, A Thief's End is a lot more non-linear. Well, the levels are mostly just a complicated straight line, but a few like to change it up a little bit, giving them a real sense of adventure in a bunch of different scenarios. That level in Africa is just... Oh, Naughty Dog, you've been doing some fine work these past couple of years, I feel like more people need to tell you that. There's some more obvious additions too, the grappling hook lets you traverse some landscapes where the path through is a little less obvious, and opens up a whole new dimension for combat. Oh hey, and there's some actual proper stealth mechanics this time around, and they're used in more than one level too. Do you actually steal anything from a museum in this game? Wow, Uncharted has grown up.
there's few things more frustrating than looking forward to a game that you ultimately aren't able to play. You get that when a game is delayed, but there's not a lot you can do about that. Should be worth it in the end. Games are really delayed for no reason. No, I mean when there's very little you can do on your end to play a game that you've been excited for, and I'm sure you can remember who's got internet made of potatoes. Makes it pretty hard to play Overwatch. But I think it's a testament to the quality of Overwatch that I started using specialized mobile internet that's much faster, but costs a bundle to top up for the sole purpose of experiencing more of this incredible game. Really, with a game that's multiplayer only, there's a tendency to forget about any kind of story or narrative thread and just push on with making the gameplay as accessible as possible. Overwatch does both excellently, and while there isn't a story mode at this time, you're still heavily immersed in this world filled with genuine characters that hides detailed lore if that sort of thing interests you. What I'm trying to say is that Overwatch isn't just a point and squirt shooter that does all it needs to do. It goes out of its way to make the gameplay varied enough to welcome anyone, made easier by Blizzard's ability to listen to fans and give them what they want. Set against this gloriously colourful backdrop and a large German man talking about his love of David Hasselhoff. What more could you ask for? This is Rebel Luigi, and the only complaint I can level against Overwatch is that some of the people playing it have polluted the competitive scene when they get a little bit too riled up by their teammates not doing what they're told. This was inevitable, since Overwatch wants to be an eSport and everyone wants to be the best at this game which has only recently come out. Though, frankly, if the worst thing about a game is that some of the people playing it can be dicks from time to time, I will gladly take that. Hello everybody, thank you so much for watching. Was the positivity too much? Would it have been better if I made a video that lamented the decline of Western society and how it affected the quality of video games in 2016? Well, that video is still to come and on Christmas Day of all time, so I, I guess you can look forward to that if you want. In the meantime, uh, play good games, be good to each other. Uh, I, I have a Patreon that I need to update, I, should, I might do that after this actually. Also, I need to finalize my move to Canada at some point. They're asking me to take a test to assess my ability to speak English. Je ne sais pas pourquoi.